Hi everyone, um, I'm, I'm Zach, I'm the CTO of um, the Aztec Protocol. We're a um, privacy preserving, um, like we enable privacy preserving smart contracts on Ethereum. Um, but I'm here today to talk about a new R&D project that we've been um, working on in collaboration with um, Ariel Gabazon at Protocol Labs, uh, Plonk. <laughs> um, and um, this talk is kind of just, um, I was told to not spare any detail. So I'm going, to, this is a talk to kind of get into the guts of Plonk, how it works, um, in like, and how you, act, how you convert, how you, you um, create a succinct um, argument of knowledge out of polynomial commitment schemes. Um, so, uh, I think, um, yeah, uh, Alessandro gave a, a, a very thorough overview of this, so I'll, I'll just give that very high-level summary. There are kind of three flavors of SNARK, and I'm kind of including Stark in this world, uh, where you have this, the non-universal ones where you have circuit-specific trusted setups. Uh, generally, they're very efficient to, um, for both prover and verifier, but uh, you have this, prop, this coordination problem of managing these trusted setups, and the common reference string you need is quite large. Um, then you have universal set, um, snarks, so that's in the vein of Sonic, um, Marlin, and Plonk, where you only need one trusted setup for arbitrary circuits that you want to create. Um, and then you have a, per circuit, you have this kind of pre-processing step that's transparent um, and trustless. Uh, the reference strings that get produced are generally smaller than non-universal snarks. Um, the verifiers are still succinct, but the proven and verify efficiencies are generally a little bit worse than uh, non-universal. And then finally, you have the transparent world, uh, where you use um, things like uh, IOP-based um, polynomial commitment schemes or groups of unknown order um, to implement um, uh, a holographic proof system like Marlin or Plonk, and you um, don't have a trusted setup, but you suffer with a slightly higher proof sizes. So the, the new wave uh, of snarks that's been kind of coming out uh, over the last few, few months, um, there's been like an, an enormous uh, amount of innovation, um, a rather snarky summer. Um, and uh, so circuit construction um, for um, Marlin and Plonk really takes place in two phases. You have this reference string generation that requires a trusted setup and then a circuit specialization phase. Um, uh, and yeah, um, just kind of summarizing what I said earlier. So, Plonk. <laughs> um, uh, Plonk is a universal snark where your, it doesn't use R1CS. Um, instead, it uses a more um, simpler um, arithmetization where your circuit is defined using addition and multiplication gates. Um, the benefits to this is the proof efficiency and the verify efficiency are really quite good. Um, the proof sizes are very small, but you do pay for your additions. Um, they aren't free like they are in Growth 16. However, um, you, you can implement uh, very interesting custom gates, um, which can provide a lot of it. Uh, like quite powerful functionality, which I'll go into at the end of this talk. Um, we have um, some benchmarks now. Uh, the library, our proof construction library, it is very new. It is only a, f a few weeks old. Uh, proof of concept, you know, health warnings and all of that. But we were getting quite good times for uh, both the prover and the verifier. Um, specifically, for about one million gates, the proof construction time was under 23 seconds, and there's quite a lot of low-hanging fruit we can use do to optimize that. Um, uh, and this is all using the BN254 curve, which is the curve that Ethereum supports with pre-compiles. Um, so, yeah, one million gates all in, pretty good, particularly when you can actually do quite, um, you can create quite expressive gates that um, uh, perform a lot of work. So, for example, in the kind of the full implementation of Plonk, um, uh, Boolean constraints are free, uh, things like you can do MIMC hash rounds with a single gate, um, and you can do elliptic curve point additions with two gates. So if you need to do things like Pedersen hashes, valid zero knowledge proofs, um, you can get quite low uh, gate counts. Um, so it's, it's good at that kind of stuff. It's very good at binary decomposition, um, but it's not good when you have uh, high fan-in um, addition gates, when you have these quite long linear relationships. And so you get this with um, sponge-based uh, hash functions in particular, uh, and thing where you, things where you need matrix addition and multiplication. Um, so when it comes to proof sizes, um, all in your proof sizes will be 512 bytes um, for the BN curve. Uh, if you want to use, so I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about uh, this turbo plonk construction that we have, uh, that we're building, um, which uh, makes certain arithmetic operations very efficient. That will add 128 bytes to your proof size. Um, but you can see here some dummy, some example constraint counts, both if you're just using addition multiplication gates and if you want to use some more, um, so some more advanced uh, gate constructions that we have. Um, and uh, so these constraint counts are pretty low. So for, for if you want to do binary decomposition, so you'll need that for, you know, if you want typed integers um, or things like SHA-256 spec 2 b um, the constraint count is you, you only need half the number of gates that you have binary bits you're concatenating. Bulls are free, 
um, you can evaluate a, a Mimsy hash round in a single gate, which means like for, for the 129 bit security level, it's about like 50, I believe, uh, gates for hash. So this can get quite quite efficient, um, but you do lose the the generality of ARM and CS, um, which which means you do have to kind of construct your circuits using some some like more plonk specific primitives. Um, so that's kind of what Plonk does, but what is Plonk? How does Plonk work? How, do, how does, you know, how, in general, how do universal snarks work? Um, like the recipe is pretty straightforward. The primitives that we use are pretty, pretty, pretty simple. You want to represent your program as an arithmetic circuit. You then want to kind of find a way of describing your circuit using a polynomial identity, um, because you can then use a succinct polynomial commitment scheme like the CATE scheme to uh, succinctly commit to your, um, both the, the witnesses in your circuit uh, and the kind of, um, uh, a succinct uh, and the succinct description of your circuit that will, that will be performed in the pre-processing step. Um, and then you can, uh, the verifier can efficiently evaluate whether you've correctly uh, 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 satisfied the circuit description. Um, this can be instantiated over any polynomial commitment scheme. So the uh, plonk like Marlin, it's, it's completely divorced from the underlying cryptographic primitives that you use to commit to these polynomials. Uh, you can use uh, like an IP-based scheme, like uh, the one that Alexander Vlasov and the Matter Labs guys put out, or Fractal, uh, pairing-based with Cat A, or even groups it on in order um, with the new dark protocol that's come out recently. Um, so plonk uh, in the title, the title technically stands for permutations over Lagrange bases, um, and then some other, other words that are a little bit bit of a backronym, but um, we use Lagrange bases to encode our kind of witnesses because they provide a very natural way of um, representing vectors as polynomials. Um, so what we do is if you have uh, like n gates in your circuit, um, you want to find a multiplicative subgroup which has an order of n or more. Um, and so um, if you're working with prime fields, this will be a root of unity. So you'll find like an nth root of unity. Um, and then you can um, cr create a polynomial that represents a, um, a vector by um, taking, for each vector element, you multiply that vector value uh, by a specific Lagrange polynomial. And a Lagrange polynomial is one of these polynomials where when you evaluate it, all of the members of the subgroup, all of the roots of unity that you have, uh, it's going to equal, evaluate to zero, apart from one of the subgroup elements. And so this is this kind of animated GIF is trying to show that, that basically these are 10 uh, Lagrange polynomials where um, each polynomial is only going to be one at one specific evaluation point on the x-axis. Um, and then you take a linear sum of these to represent your, your vector. Um, the reason why this is useful is because it means that if you have some arithmetic expression you want to evaluate um, that involves kind of uh, vector elements and vector dot products, then you can kind of directly map that into polynomial form, where if you have your, these Lagrange base encoded polynomials, then any arith arithmetic expression involving vec the vectors um, also holds for the polynomials, except that instead of checking that some expression is equal to zero, you check is equal to zero modulo the vanishing polynomial of your subgroup. So here, that, um, that vanishing polynomial will be the lowest degree polynomial that cuts through um, the um, x-axis at um, uh, all when evaluated at all of the subgroup elements. So this is a bit of a mess, this graph, but what I was trying to show here is if you have um, like some, if you a of x, b of x, and c of x um, encode some witness values, then if you take a of x times v of x plus c of x, uh, c of x, then at every single one of these special x coordinates, um, the resulting polynomial, which is going to be this orangey thing, will also cut through, it'll also evaluate to zero um, at all of these evaluation points. And therefore, you know um, for sure that the vanishing, that it will be perfectly divisible by the vanishing polynomial. So that basically all you need to do is check that your polynomial expression doesn't have any kind of remainder term. Uh, this is also then useful because you can use the short simple lemma to, um, uh, instead of the verifier, evaluating these polynomials and doing complex polynomial arithmetic, which is going to be expensive if your polynomials have degree uh, 10 million, um, the verifier just needs to um, extract an, um, the evaluation of these polynomials at a random evaluation point, uh, because if this polynomial entity holds at a random evaluation point, it with overwhelming probability holds at every evaluation point. So. Plonk's made up of additional multiplication gates, and so we want to create some kind of mathematical expression uh, that we can use to test that all of the, 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 the gates, um, the gate arithmetic has been satisfied. And ideally, we want one I mathematical expression and not, not one for additions and multiplications because it makes, because uh, you have extra polynomial commitments and it makes things a bit more complicated. So um, 
this uh, um, in vector form, these are quite simple. Basically, you just create some kind of constant coefficient vectors. Um, so these are these are created when you um, compile your circuit. And what they're doing is they're either they're just their constant scaling factors on the wires in your in e uh, in each gate. So you can either turn send wires to zero. You can scale up the constants if you want. You can add a constant term in if you need th need need there to be one. And this culminates in the kind of the Planck arithmetic gate. It's a kind of a combined addition and multiplication gate, where um, uh, on the bottom left, that's kind of the, the, the expression you're evaluating, where all of the Q vectors are um, defined when you c compile your circuit, and all of the W vectors are witnesses that the prover has to create. Um, and then you can, um, in polynomial land, you just you can very efficiently convert these into a Lagrange in base encoded polynomials, and then you can test if you have like 10 or 100 million of these gates, you can evaluate they've all been satisfied succinctly by testing this one polynomial identity, which can be done very efficiently using a succinct polynomial commitment scheme. So that's the easy bit. <laughs> um, one second. What I've just described is a way of checking that uh, a very large number of additional multiplication gates have their, like the, the arithmetic for each gate has been satisfied. But that kind of gets you to this world where basically you just have a bunch of unconnected, uncoordinated gates that you know the input out and the output wires um, map, like, are correct. But to describe meaningful, interesting circuits, um, you need to have some kind of wire consistency check as well. You need to check that the wires feeding into all of these gates um, correctly map, uh, uh, um, uh, follow what was intended when, um, by the circuit um, creator. Um, and specifically, that's going to revolve down to checking copy relationships. So if you have a split wire like this, you need to check somehow that the wires feeding into these two gates contain the same value, that there has been, that the, the wire value has been correctly copied. And this is where, where Planck uses a permutation argument in a similar manner to uh, Sonic, um, and a permutation argument which I believe was originally um, proposed by Bayer and Groth in 2012. Um, we want to use a not copy argument to prove that our split wires contain the same value. And so here's a little example that um, actually uh, Mary Malley came up with when I was chatting with her about how on earth to, des to describe permutations. Um, imagine you have five wire values um, where the colors of each square represents the, the, the value of the wire and the integer is the index of the wire. So we want to check that the first, the fourth, and the fifth wires contain the same value. What you can do to do that is you create a permutation mapping where you map these, these wire values to different indices. So you map the first wire value to the fifth, the fourth to the first, the fifth to the fourth. And then you check that your promoted blocks, they have the same color, that basically um, that these, the, um, the values of these two sets um, are identical. And if they are, then you've correctly uh, followed your copy uh, relationships, um, and therefore you have, uh, you, you, you have a wire consistency check. Uh, so the way we do this is by um, using some uh, randomness um, and basically creating, uh, mixing in both the index of, your of, of the wire and its value into, into a single expression um, uh, with some uh, gated by randomness. Um, so we do this for every wire value, both for this kind of the, the, the original ordering of your um, wire values, which we call the identity permutation, and then the permuted ordering, which um, validates the copy relationships. The idea here is that if you take um, this high, you, so you take your index, you multiply it by a random beta, then you add in uh, another random element and your, your wire witness value. Um, if you do that for the identity permutation, uh, the identity um, ordering and the permutation ordering, then if you take the product of these two uh, um, constru constru constructs, um, they should be identical to one another. And so um, the, the one divided by the other should be equal to one. Um, I have a bit of a work example here to try and explain some of the intuition behind this. So imagine the, the green wires are equal to five, the blue, one, the cyan one's equal to 10, and the blue one's equal to two. Um, so we have our permutation mapping of we map uh, one to five, two maps to itself, three maps to itself, four maps to one, and five maps to four. So what we have here are basically, again, vectors um, of kind of um, permuted wire values. Uh, and the important takeaway thing to take away from this is that uh, each the, in, in both vectors, the bracketed terms are identical to one another, they're just in a di different jumbled up order. And if you are a malicious prover and you want to cheat, um, and imagine you haven't correctly followed the permutation, so imagine your, the first y value is not equal to the fifth y value, then you're going to have a mismatch in one of these terms that you're going to have to somehow like, um, m account for by mutating uh, an additional y value in your circuit. However, you're not able to do that because um, 
that's where, because the, um, each individual term is multiplied by different random coefficients, um, that's where the beta and gammas come in. Uh, and so the, the um, kind of the, the probability of being able to fake a permutation is um, basically the same, roughly the same probability of, of finding a collision in a hash function, um, and which is what we want. Um, the takeaway from this is, well, that's like in theory, that's how you do a permutation, right? You 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 create this kind of um, mapping that maps wire values to permuted indices to check your copy relationships, and then you perform this kind of grand product where you take the product of all of your um, mutated y values and you do the same for your mutated y values according to your permutation and if those products match you're good and if they don't if they aren't then you you you're, you've been cheating however that's something that's quite hard to commit to it's quite hard to create a, an arithmetic relationship in polynomials that check this because what we really want to do in order to check that that's the case if you have a kind of a polynomial commitment to your grand product terms so um, for each Lagrange index, so for this, um, you're kind of accumulating these, these uh, products together, then you then need to somehow check within a, you need to compute the product, all of the kind of the Lagrange coefficients of a single polynomial commitment. Um, and that's quite hard because effectively it means you need to do a right shift on your vectors um, before you've encoded them as polynomials. Um, where basically like the, the, the next element in your vector is equal to the previous one multiplied by this kind of the, the fractional uh, contributions of uh, like one of, of your i's wire value according to the identity permutation and its copy permutation. Uh, and so you need to, you basically this boils down to needing a right shift on a, like on a, on a vector that you've encoded as a Lagrange based polynomial. Uh, how do you do that? Well, it's actually quite simple. Um, this was really what started Planck out. This was when I was, I was chatting to Ariel um, a few months ago, and I thought this problem was, was unsolvable, and he was like, oh yeah, it's easy, this is, this is what you do. <laughs> um, uh, basically, if you have a polynomial, a polynomial encoded in this form where it evaluates to witness values um, when at specific subgroup group elements, so in this case, roots of unity, then all you need to do is you take the same polynomial and you evaluate it at some random value, and another random, and then you evaluate it at that same random value multiplied by the generator of that subgroup, by the primitive root of unity. Because what you're doing there is you're basically just accessing the next element in your witness vector, um, which is what you want. That's a right shift. Basically, if you have z of x, then if you if take z of x times omega, where omega is a primitive root of unity, then that polynomial is going to be the, exactly the same as z of x, except all the witness values have been effectively right shifted. And so this is, creates quite, a, quite an efficient permutation argument because you can evaluate this permutation with a single commitment by the prover, this, this Z polynomial, um, where you check, you t uh, basically you, you um, that fractional term that we had uh, in the previous slide, you, you kind of, you, you multiply out by the, by the uh, denominator and you get this relationship, this relationship here, where you have your kind of your, if Z of X kind of represents the current, um, your current vector values of your grand product, then Z of X omega will equal, um, represents the, this, the future values of your grand product argument shifted by one. Um, and so you multiply z of x omega by the denominator of that fraction, z of x by the numerator, you take the, pro the difference between the two, and if it's equal to zero modulo the vanishing polynomial, then you know that the polynomial z of x correctly kind of accumulates these grand product terms that you need to validate your permutation. Um, and then the final last thing you need to do to actually check your permutation check has been satisfied is, well, because we have this, we are computing this kind of fraction relationship of, of products um, that needs to be equal to one. So what you need to do is you need to check that your last vector element is one, and you need to check that your first vector element is one, um, because it, it's so that your grand product starts out at one. Um, but here's the thing: if you if you validate that your first grand product, um, if you validate the first element of z of x is one. You've also evaluated, you've also verified the last element is, of z of x is one because of the previous check. Um, because you're, you're working with a multiplicative subgroup where everything wraps around, then um, z, if, if z of x evaluates, um, when you evaluate that at the last subgroup element, then z of x omega will evaluate, will result to the first subgroup element. So you only need these two simple checks uh, to check the, the, your kind of copy arguments for your circuit. Um, and that creates this thing um, here. This is, this is, um, the quotient polynomial. So what this thing is, is it's taking the permutation um, check that you need to perform 
um, as well as the arithmetic check you need to um, evaluate that your gates have been satisfied. And you kind of batch it all together into one single polynomial of commitment by using this, these, um, so R here is going to be some random challenge provided by the, by the verifier. Um, and you just create la random linear combinations of these arithmetic expressions uh, where if, um, if T of X is equal to, um, uh, basically, if, um, if all of these arithmetic expressions equal are equal to zero modulo the vanishing polynomial, then um, the, same will be, the same will hold of, of uh, T of X. Uh, like, well, T of X will, um, will not, won't have a remainder when, when multiplied by the vanishing polynomial. Um, uh, and this means that basically the, it, really, it means the proof size for Planck is really quite uh, marginal. Um, you have originally, uh, initially you, you have kind of five commitments to five polynomials. Uh, here T of X is quotient polynomial because you're kind of multiplying four terms together and then dividing by the vanishing polynomial. Its degree is going to be three times higher than the rest. So you want to kind of commit to that uh, by splitting it out into three um, commi polynomial commitments to the same degree as your original ones. So that gives you seven uh, uh, elliptical group elements, and then you additionally you need two two more group elements for the cat a opening proof because uh, you're opening your polynomials at two evaluation points. Um, the overall proof of cost, therefore, is dominated by effectively what is nine times the, like the number of group exponentiations the proof has to perform, which is kind of the the traditionally the dominant cost for these ver for constructing these proofs uh, is nine times the number of gates, um, which is quite low, um, and it means that proof construction is quite fast. Before I continue, um, that was a bit of a, a, a lightning tour around uh, a, a rather tricky concept which I always struggle to explain. So does anybody have any questions? Great, cool. Assume everyone, everyone's, everyone, uh, let, let's clear up everything then, clearly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I mean, I'm around after, the, after if, you, if you want to chat about it. Um, so is that the end? No, <laughs> um, not by a long shot. So here's the thing. Um, with Planck, as we described it in the paper, um, are the arithmetic expressions you're evaluating are just addition and multiplication gates. But there's absolutely no reason why this needs to be the case because effectively what you're doing in Planck is you're performing this pre-processing step where you're creating these selected polynomials that you use to turn off or on arithmetic expressions. And there's no reason why you can't include more complex arithmetic expressions in your verification equations because all it's going to cost you um, if, you're, if you're clever about it, is just additional selector polynomials. So your pre-processing step will be more time consuming, but that only has to happen once per circuit, so it's not that big a deal. Um, and it doesn't really affect prover efficiency, um, and it will only marginally affect verifier efficiency, because the more se every selector polynomial you add into your um, circuit, uh, the verifier needs to perform one additional group exponentiation, but still the pairing cost is going to be dominating uh, over the group exponential cost unless, unless you have like an enormous number of selector polynomials. So instead of this, what about this? Um, yeah, so what I'm trying to describe here is a couple of things that you can do for Planck for free without increasing proof or verifier efficiency. Um, specifically, you can, if you want to, you can access, if you, for a given gate, you can access the next gate's Y values um, for free. Um, because this is because um, we are in our proof, we are evaluating. Uh, 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 sorry, <laughs> a bit slow. But no, God, <laughs> there we go. Um, so you're evaluating this this polynomial uh, z of x. Uh, you're evaluating at two valuation points, some random point uh, value chosen by the verifier, and that random value multiplied by omega, the the generator of your multiplicative subgroup. And because you can batch together Cati polynomial commitments, polynomial commitments, um, you can then also evaluate your um, wire commitments at these two evaluation points. Uh, and so you can also perform a right shift on your wire val witness values. And therefore, if you want, your arithmetic relationships uh, for a given gate can involve the wire values for the next gate. And this is incredibly useful for a few reasons. Um, specifically, it's great for um, sequential operations. If you want to do an addition chain, for example, where you're concatenating together, you're writing together ra um, values uh, into, a, into a sum, then if you have access to the next gate's output wire, then the current gate's output wire you can treat as an input wire. Um, and then add in, so, and then your left and right wires you can kind of accumulate into, your, into a sum. So effectively, um, for um, concatenating together values into a sum, you don't need, if you're um, combining n values, you don't need n addition gates, you need n over two addition gates. Um, but you can also do some more interesting things. So this is kind of um, what we're implementing right now with our Planck proof of concept. Um, so instead of, if, you, if this is kind of zooming in on a gate, 
where what I have here is kind of almost like a main bus of wire witness values that, that, um, on, uh, on, the, on the bottom here. And so this is for one individual gate. And so obviously, like, as you progress down your circuit, these wire values are going to change according to the permutations that you've defined. Um, and so what you can do is you can have these individual arithmetic expressions for certain bits of discrete functionality that are gated behind selector polynomials, uh, which can either be turned on or off at will. So you can have things like um, an extended addition multiplication gate. And by extended, I mean it uses the output wire of the next gate, if you need it. Um, you can do things like Boolean satisfiability gates. So basically, if you want to constrain a wire value to be a bool, you can do that for free, because you basically you just turn on the selector polynomial for your bool constraint. And that can run in kind of parallel to your addition and multiplication gates. And then you can get some more interesting things, like you can do a mimic hash round gate, um, where you can do an entire round of the mimic hash function uh, with a single gate. Um, and then at the mo more extreme end, you can complete, um, you can evaluate um, elliptic curve point addition on short Weierstrass curves, um, effectively in a single gate. Um, although in practice, the, the, the aggregate cost of this is going to be two gates, because this um, e elliptic curve gate is going to be consuming um, the wires that have been kind of allocated to the next gate in your circuit. And so that next gate is almost overwhelmingly going to have to be uh, a no-op gate because you're not going to be able to form any interesting arithmetic relationships in that gate because you've kind of used, the, you've, um, its Y value has been fixed by the elliptic curve gate. But basically you can do point addition in two gates, um, which is quite useful. Um, and so just to give maybe some examples of how this would work. So this is the, this will be the arithmetic expression for the extended addition gate, where it looks exactly the same as the arithmetic expression for the original addition gate. It's just that you have this extra term tacked on here in the end. You have an extra selected polynomial, and then you've got your um, commitments to your output wires but evaluated at um, x multiplied by the primitive root of unity, which is free to get. Uh, and similarly, Boolean gates here, this is a Boolean check for the left wires, where you have a selected polynomial, and then you just take the left wires, you square it, subtract out the left wire, and if that's equal to zero modulo Lavangian polynomial, then hey, you've got a bool. Um, for free. Uh, and then similar, and then things get a bit more complicated with the, the MIMC gate uh, here. <laughs> but um, basically, uh, because you're kind of, you're, you're front loading all of your computation into computing these selector polynomials, um, evaluating these gates is going to be cost effectively the same as evaluating any other gate in your circuit. Um, and this is borne out by a test. We implemented the mimic gate uh, in our proof of concept and proof construction times increased by less than 10%. Um, but the number of constraints you need in your circuit decreased by a factor of like, uh, like five because um, you, you doing a mimic round will only take five gates. And then finally, uh, for anybody that's interested, this is, this is the formulas you need to evaluate elliptic curve point addition. Um, so what this is doing is it's basically just, if you have three elliptic curve points, that's six, that's six values, you can assign them to one of your six wires, um, and then the expression to check that you are um, correctly followed the point addition formula um, if you, you can skip out the normal traditional intermediate terms you need by just inflating the degrees of these polynomials by, um, to basically um, by, by a factor of two, um, which is fine because um, the, this won't increase the degree of your quotient polynomial because that degree is already kind of fixed by your permutation argument. Um, and this, the degree of this is the same degree as your, degree of your permutation argument. Uh, so effectively, this, 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 this would effectively be free. It would cost about five to 10% um, of, uh, if of your previous efficiency. So that's kind of uh, it for me. That's kind of a, a bit of a well one short plonk how it works, um, what we're trying to do with it, um, and the kind of circuits you can create out of it uh, remarkably efficiently. Uh, I guess the last thing for me is uh, we're actually, um, at the moment, running a trusted setup multi party computation. Uh, so you generate the structured reference string you need to construct plonk, plonk proof as a knowledge. I believe it also will work for Marlin. Um, over the Barretta Nereg 254 curve, the old Zcash curve, and the one that you can efficiently access in Ethereum uh, through its precompiles. Um, and yeah, so if you want to sign up, go to our website, aztecprotocol.com. There are still slots if people want to take part. Uh, we'll be running for the entire month. And yeah, thank you very much. Cool. So I think, I think we actually, we have time for like one question in our 15 minutes off, but actually it would be great if Ben, you want to come set up in the meantime. Um, yeah, so if there are any questions, any more questions, thoughts, ideas. <coughs> Maybe um, a comment that, uh, so I think this specialization of uh, polynomials to specific subcomputations is something I would like to highlight as something very powerful for specific applications. Um, it's also not, it's something you can easily deploy in pretty much any of the 
current SNARK constructions, like for example, you could go back, if you wanted to, to GROT16 and specialize the underlying linear PCP for repeated MIMC computations and, uh, uh, say, elliptic curves. And uh, it's something that, uh, you know, if you're reading an academic paper and you say, and you don't see any of this stuff going on, you know, don't, don't be afraid. You know, most likely you can deploy, you know, very similar ideas. Uh, I think it's very powerful. Like again, academics don't particularly bother on specific applications to to kind of construct all these gadgets, but they can make enormous differences, like in practice. Like if you have a computation that it's all elliptic curve operations, and please take your underlying probabilistic proof and uh, you know come up with polynomials that are uh, sort of uh, representing those operations directly. Uh, it's basically a trade-off between software and hardware of the underlying arithmetization. Either you have the circuit or one CS simulate uh, kind of these uh, gadgets, or you kind of come up directly with polynomials that represent these computations. I think, I, I think it's a predictor we're gonna see a lot more of this uh, uh, as we care more about efficiency of uh, particular applications. Yeah, um, I, 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 I agree entirely. I mean, if anybody, anybody who knows me, I've been talking people's ear off about these custom gates for quite a while, <laughs> um, this because of their, 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 their power and utility. Um, particularly holographic proof systems, I think are particularly well suited to this because your kind of, your arithmetic gates, sorry, I'm kind of, uh, your arithmetic gates no longer, uh, if you take something like a previous season like GROSS16, uh, your arithmetic expressions have to directly reflect the group homomorphisms available to you with, um, in your underlying crypto system. Um, so that's one of the reasons why it's limited to additional applications. If you wanted to do a more complicated gate like a MIMC, you would need more pairings. It would get a little bit co more complicated. But with holographic proofs, um, well, you're just committing to more polynomials. That no longer is the case. Um, and yeah, so we'll, what, yeah, we'll be seeing more of this, I suspect. Um, I Yes, maybe. Do you have do you have time for another? Uh, so you you mentioned in the beginning of um, um, you mentioned the difference between uh, un universal and specific setup, and then the moment on your first slide on Chubber Plunk, you mentioned that Chubber Plunk was somewhat more specific. It's clear that Chubber Plunk is more specific in the acceptance of uh, uh, more custom gates. What do I lose in terms of, uh, in if anything, in terms of universality? You don't lose anything in terms of universality. It's still this, um, it's still updatable. The the reference string doesn't change. It's just the pre -pro how you pre-process that reference string. string sure. to the the pre-processing is is specific and must be compatible with the the custom gates you're defining, or for that matter, the custom operations, right? Yes, exactly. So so it's a transparent process, but obviously it's it's more tailored towards uh, like Planck and polynomial commitments, and so. Um, it's harder to kind of generalize that to other proving systems um, that use R1, like, well, uh, to other non-holographic systems that use R1CS, like GOS16.